as a corporate body here to worship you in spirit and in truth. Open our hearts and our minds to your truth, Lord. Help us to turn our faces toward you and to receive your word with joy and to walk out of this place and apply it to our lives. Fill us with your spirit so we can accomplish your purposes. We praise you and thank you for what you're doing in the lives of these here. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there's a story told by Paul Lee Tan that illustrates the meaning of redemption. And he says that when A.J. Gordon was a pastor uh, in Boston, he met a young boy in front of the sanctuary who was carrying a cage of birds. And the pastor said to the boy, what are you, what are you going to do? Where did you get those birds? And the boy said, I trapped them in the field. He said, what are you going to do with them? He said, well, I guess I'm going to play with them for a little while, and then I'm going to feed them to an old cat of mine. And the pastor said, well, uh, how about if I buy the birds from you? The boy says, Pastor, you wouldn't want these birds. They're just old and they, they don't sing very well. But the pastor said, I'll give you two dollars for the bird and the cage. The birds and the cage. The boy said, that's a good deal. And so uh, the pastor paid him the two dollars. The boy went away happily singing with the coins in his pocket. And the pastor took the bird cage and walked around to the, behind the church and released the birds into the air. He brought that cage into the sanctuary the next Sunday and used it as an illustration of God's redemption of humanity. And what he said was this. He said, as the next Sunday, he said, I, I, I took the cage to the pulpit to illustrate my sermon about Christ coming to seek the saved and to save the lost, paying for them with his own precious blood. The boy told me that the, the birds were not songsters, said Gordon. But when I released them and they winged their way to heaven, it seemed that they were singing, Redeem, Redeem, Redeem. Amen. You and I have been held captive to sin, friends. Christ has purchased our pardon and He has set us at liberty. We have been set free from the bondage of sin by the redemption provided by Christ Jesus. We need to realize that just like Ruth was in need of a redeemer, a kinsman redeemer, you and I are also in need of a redeemer. So our goal today is to understand really the connection between the life, the real life illustration here of Ruth and Boaz and the redemption that's, that's being offered here and the redemption that you and I have as believers. To better understand what I'm talking about, we're in chapter 3 of the book of Ruth today. You can turn with me to chapter 3 of the book of Ruth. I will read the entire chapter as you follow along. Ruth chapter 3. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative with those young women, women you were? And see, he's winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, and then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, All that you say, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over. Behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it's true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight, and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good. Let him do it. But if he's not willing to redeem you, then, as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until morning. 
So she laid his feet until morning, but arose before anyone could recognize another. And he said, Let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, Bring the garment you're wearing and hold it out. So she held it, and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. And then she went into the city, and when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, How did you fare, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, These six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said, You must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. And she replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. That's a little bit larger piece of text than we're accustomed to going over, but it really all is tied together to the one main point today. And so if you will, go back with me and let's review together really what's happened here. First, we'll notice that, that Naomi intimates her knowledge about Boaz's whereabouts on the threshing floor. She knows he's going to be there tonight, so she instructs Ruth to go there and gives her specific details on what she should do with Boaz. Now, she gives Ruth what we here in the 21st century might consider a rather forward and bizarre charge. He's, he's, she says, go and wait until he has eaten and drunk and is married, and go and uncover his feet and lie down at his, at his feet. She tells Ruth to wash and anoint herself and put on a cloak and go down there to the threshing floor. And she tells her not to make herself known to Boaz until after he's had his fill. And so she complies with this. And I want us to understand that asking her to go and lie down at Boaz's feet, some would say is some sort of a sexual reference. That is not the case. This is a cultural way that a person would submit themselves to another. And what she's doing is she is offering herself in marriage. This is a marriage proposal and it's cultural and is perfectly acceptable. Boaz would have known what's going on. Ruth understood what was going on and she complied with Naomi's request to follow this directive. Okay. Now the threshing floor, this is a place where, where the grain is beaten out and it's thrown into the air to separate the chaff. And this is harvest time and it's a very labor intensive time. And so they'd be working from sun up to sundown and then they probably have their meal afterwards and the text tells us that Boaz had a little bit to drink. He's probably trying to relax himself, get a good night's rest to wake up for another labor intensive day tomorrow. And so this is the stage you set for what's going on here. But touching and holding Boaz's feet is an act of submission. So she's, she's surrendering herself to Boaz and she's, she's submitting to Boaz, but she is asking for his hand in marriage. Now this is a bold move that called for a decision from Boaz immediately because what she's doing is she's being very forward saying, hey, will you, will you be my kinsman redeemer? Will you, will you marry me? But it goes even, even deeper than that. I mean, the text is clear. Naomi knows that Boaz will tell Ruth what to do. And she knows about this Leverite law con concerning the kinsman redeemer. And we've, we've learned about this as we study the book of Genesis. This idea of the Leverite law means, of course, Ruth is a widow. She has no heir. She has no son. And so there's got to be some way for her dead husband's lineage to be carried forward. So what she's asking of Boaz is not simply to marry her. She is asking for him to provide her with an heir for her deceased husband. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. So this idea of the Levite law, this law stated that if a husband dies without providing an heir, that the nearest relative was to marry the widow and provide this child. And so this person acts as this protector. She says, you know, spread your wings over me. In other words, I've got nobody to protect me. And so I need, I need someone to, to care for me, to, to take care of me, but also to provide an heir for my, my deceased husband. There are a couple of things that, the, that this, uh, this Leverite law could make provision for, and I'll tell you what those are. First of all, it would be to buy back property that the family had sold. And we're going to read about that, how that happens and how Boaz goes in to identify this land that originally belonged to Elimelech, which is the, the father or the husband of Naomi. 
Another thing that kinsman redeemer would do is to provide an heir for the deceased relative, which we talked about, or to buy back a family member that was sold into slavery. That would be another way that they would be a kinsman redeemer. Or lastly, maybe to avenge a relative who had been murdered. So we know what the context of this is for the Leverite law is that Ruth does not have a son. She does not have an heir to carry on her husband's lineage. And so she's asking Boaz to marry her and to provide her with an heir so that they would be able to continue the line. That's what's going on. Now, what does that have to do with us? Well, if we looked at Isaiah in chapter 60 of Isaiah, verse 16, God is called the Redeemer of Israel. And, of course, we know that Jesus Christ is, is our Redeemer. And so as we look at this idea of kinsman Redeemer, this idea of being redeemed, that's, that's the context we're looking at. So in this case, Boaz is asking to be the kinsman who would redeem Ruth and provide an heir. And that means to reclaim one as their own. So if we're being redeemed, then God is reclaiming us as his own. He's saving us. He's saving us. This is salvation. So Ruth's obedient. She does exactly what Naomi instructs her to do. And uh, like Naomi instructs her, Ruth washes herself. This is just a ritual that is in preparation for a marriage proposal. And she waits for Boaz to eat and drink and to lie down. And she uncovers his feet and lies down. And the text tells us that it's about midnight. Boaz is stirring around and boom, he notices that there's this person lying at his feet. And he's like, who are you? <laughs> And Ruth said, well, I'm, I'm Ruth, your, your servant. And then it's when she asks, spread your wings over me, which means protect me, take care of me, marry me, and then provide, make, make provision for, for my family. And he agrees to do that. He says, I'll do, I'll do what you ask. But then he goes in and he says, there's another person who's a closer relative to me. Now, some folks will say that Boaz is looking for some way to get out of this. No, Boaz is a very honorable man. And the first thing out of his mouth is, I'll do what you ask. So that's, that's false. He, he's, not, he's not looking for a way to get out of what he's doing. He's being honorable. He's completely following the letter of the law. He says there's someone, a relative, that's closer than me. And we need to check with them first before I step in. Because you see, if he stepped in and this other person came back, they would be able to say, by law, wait a second, you're going outside of the law and that, belong, that belongs to me. The land belongs to me, I'm a limb and leg, and so does this, this person. So Boaz follows the law and he says, I'm, I'm going to go to this person and if they won't redeem you, I will do what you ask. What an honorable man. An honorable man. And he says that Ruth is a worthy woman. Now, if we return to, uh, to, to the original language, that means that she's desirable, she's valuable, and she is someone who has, has worth. And he points to the reputation that, that she has with all of the people. In walking all of that way back to a land she'd never been to, agreeing to worship a God that was not her people's God, and to protect and take care of her mother-in-law where she had no obligation to do so. Naomi released her from any obligation, and she says, no, I'll come back with you. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you go, I will go. What an honorable woman. So Boaz is going to redeem Ruth, if the other person is not willing. And so he instructs her to go ahead and slip out before dawn, so that there's not any scandalous discussion about what might have taken place when nothing really did take place other than honorable intentions. And then he goes further to instruct anyone to say, hey, no gossiping. No gossiping here. That's wisdom, isn't it? That's wisdom. Because there could have created a scandal, you know, and then Boaz makes honorable and then people are like, yeah, well, we know what went on there at the threshing floor, right? So he's very wise and caring for, making sure that nothing, nothing is spoken about that's dishonorable about this woman, because she's a very honorable woman. And Naomi is confident that the matter will be resolved. So there we have it. We've got folks that are all involved in God's plan. They're making choices and decisions on their own, but it's all playing into God's master plan and God and God's sovereignty. So what does this idea of Redeemer have to do 
with you and me. We've spoken about that just a bit. If you could turn there if you'd like, but uh, it's over in 1 Peter. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, in verses 18 and 19, we would read this. Knowing that you, believers, this is Peter, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And of course, the original Christians were Jews. They would clearly understand the idea of redemption with the kinsman redeemer. They would understand the idea of the sacrificial lamb and celebrating the Passover and all that that meant. This all points to the actions, the salvific actions of Jesus Christ as the redeemer. His blood paid the price. His blood is the redemption for your and my transgressions. Amen? Amen? So Boaz's money would purchase the land of Elimelech and his marriage would provide the heir. So he provides redemption. Jesus' blood paid the price, the rent that ransomed believers, and he atoned for sin. Now we throw that word atonement around and we, we throw words like expiation and propitiation around. I want to speak to that about specifically what that atonement, and I've heard people say incorrectly that that is, and they split up the word, and they say at one minute. That's not what atonement means, friends. Atonement is to make up for, to put in right standing. When the blood of Jesus atoned for your and my sin, friends, it made up for the transgressions that you and I have, have infracted against God it's made up for, and you and I are put in right standing with God only because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Amen. 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 I read about a small boy who was consistently late in coming home from school. And his parents would tell him, day after day, you need to be on time. You know, your mother's prepared dinner, and it's important that you're home for dinner on time. But as expected this one particular day, the boy was later than ever. He comes in, he sits down at the dinner table, and he sees sitting at, in front of his plate just a, a, a slice of bread and a cup of water. He looks at the, his father's plate, there's meat and potatoes and a fine meal. And after a, a few moments of uncomfortable silence, and the father let it sit in just a bit, the father reaches over, grabs the son's plate, puts it in front of himself, and puts the full plate in front of his son. And so, he took his own plate of meat and potatoes and put it in front of the boy and smiled at his son. When the boy grew up to a man, he said this, all my life, I have known what God is like by what my father did that night. Another word, propitiation. Uh, propitiation means the satisfaction of God's wrath. God has wrath against sin. Not the sinner. The sin. The propitiation is the satisfaction of God's wrath. So not only does Jesus' blood atone for our sin, it provides the propitiation, the satisfaction of God's wrath. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. And we've talked about this before. We talk about wages. Most of us have been or employed at this point. Praise God for employment. Amen. And we earn wages. We do things to earn the wages that we're paid. Well, the text tells us that the wages of sin is death. And that's spiritual death, my friends. That's eternal separation from God. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. The satisfaction of God's wrath toward that sin, my friends, is paid for by Jesus Christ's blood, His sacrificial blood, the blood of the Lamb, the unblemished, unspotted Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Another word that figures into this with the blood of Jesus, a less familiar word called expiation. 
I want to really clearly understand what expiation is. This is an important concept for us to get. God requires compensation for the sin of the world. Jesus' blood is that compensation. The compensation. It's a penance. It's penitence. It's an apology for messing up. Expiation is an apology. So let me be clear. Let's pull, tie all this together. Okay, here it is. The word expiation be begins with the prefix ex, which means out of or from. Out of or from. Expiation means to remove something. In biblical theology, it has to do with taking away or removing guilt by <laughs> means of paying a ransom or offering an atonement, making up for, in order to put in right standing. See? It means, expiation means to pay the penalty for something. So the act of expiation removes the problem by paying for it in some way in order to satisfy some demand. What's God's demand? Death. That's the wages. Expiation pays the price. Jesus died for you and me. He died for you and me. Christ's expiation of our sin means that He paid the penalty for it and removed it from consideration against us. On the other hand, propitiation has to do with the object of expiation. That's you and me. Okay? The prefix in this case is pro, which means for. Propitiation has to do with what brings about a change in God's, listen, attitude toward us. His attitude toward us. So that we are restored to the fellowship and favor of God. Jesus Christ's salvific acts have restored us into the favor of God Almighty, my friends. It's not by works so that no one should boast. Jesus' blood has put you in the favor of God Almighty. Amen? Amen. So, in a sense, propitiation points to God as being appeased. If I'm angry because you've offended me, but then you appease me, the problem would be removed. So propitiation brings the personal element and stresses that God is no longer angry with us. Friends, that removes our guilt. Should we be driven by guilt? No. No, we must be driven by love. Our love for our Lord drives what we do. And our actions of love drive how we deal and how we enter into a relationship with God. Propitiation is the result of expiation. It's the result. The expiation is the act that results in God's changing His attitude toward us. God's attitude toward us has changed. Why? Because it's the salvific acts of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Expiation is what Christ did on the cross. The result of Christ's acts of expiation is that God is satisfied. He is propitiated. His wrath is propitiated. It's the difference between the ransom that's paid and the attitude of one, the one receiving the <clears throat> ransom. God has received the ransom. It changes His entire attitude about you and me. We are no longer a person that God views as being out of fellowship with Him. He is satisfied with you and me because of whose we are. You and I are Christ's. We belong to Him. He paid the price for you and I. So what do we do as a result of that? We talked about this a little bit in the business meeting on Friday. I shared a devotion about the difference between different attitudes about grace and different attitudes about irrevocable salvation. Salvation's a free gift, or Ephesians 2 8, where we are saved by grace through faith, grace through faith, and that grace through faith, not of ourselves. It's a gift from God and not by works so that no one should boast. And so, how do we respond to that? Well, the one heresy that we talked about on Friday is that. We could practice what's called libertinism. Libertinism says, hey, we're saved by grace. We're kept by grace. There's nothing that, that can happen that can revoke our grace. We are saved irrevocably. And so I can live however I want and do whatever I want. Friends, that's heresy. 
You were bought with a price. You are an indentured servant with a debt you can never repay. Now we drift to the other side. It's called legalism. Legalism says, hey, you've got an obligation to keep the law, to keep things and to do things right. And if you don't, well, you're under the scrutiny of the Lord God. Both of those are heresy, my friends. What should drive us is the love of God. You and I are regenerated beings. And because we're regenerated, because that part of us that lives on is a brand new creation in Christ, we have been set free from the bondage of sin. And that means that we no longer are a prisoner to sin. No longer are we a prisoner to sin. Well, what's the root of sin? Friends, the root of sin is a lack of love for God and man. If you and I are loving completely God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourself, then we, my friends, are not sinning. The root of all sin is a lack of love. A lack of love. And so what do we do? Are we driven by guilt? No. Are we driven by anxiety? No. Are we driven by f the fear and fleeing away from those feelings that we have? No. You and I are driven by the love that God has indwelled us with. How do we express that love? We express that love by surrendering control to the Holy Spirit and allowing Him to love through us. For John 15, 5, apart from Him we can do nothing. And so, my friends, there's nothing that you and I can do to lose our salvation. But that should not be a license for us to do whatever we want to do. It's recognized, my friends, as a license to choose what we know is pleasing to God. And as believers, and when we read through the, the, the book of 1 John, 1 John describes the heart of a believer has a desire to do well. It has a desire to love. That automatically drives us. How well we do depends on how surrendered we are to the Holy Spirit. How surrendered we are to the control of the Spirit. And that control of the Spirit is more prevalent in the more mature believer. And so you and I... As we grow spiritually, as we develop into and are transformed by the renewing of our mind, you and I are more consistently controlled by the Spirit, expressing the love of God to others, and remain more in right fellowship with God. And I've given this example about fellowship, and the difference between fellowship and sonship. If one of my sons does something that's displeasing, something that's disrespectful, I may send them to their room. And while they're in their room, we are out of fellowship with each other. And until they come back to me, until they admit, until, until they agree with me, until they confess, until they say with me that they've done wrong, we will remain out of fellowship. They come back to me and I'll say, I forgive you. Of course, I always forgive. Didn't Jesus say 70 times 7? That's hyperbole. You don't count the number of times in your, uh, you know, your clicker. Okay, 70 times 7, I'm at my limit with you. No, no. It's a hyperbole saying that when, whenever, as many times, and, and in Luke it says, it clarifies, as many times as he returns to you, forgive him 70 times 7. My son returns to me and says, I, I confess that I have wronged you, and I say I forgive you, and we're back in right fellowship. But all the while, all the while, they never cease being my son. Just like the Israelites were out of fellowship with the Lord God when they, when they constructed the golden calf. And God illustrated that by putting the tent of meeting outside the camp. Separated by fellow, uh, in fellowship. They never ceased being God's chosen people, but they were out of fellowship. So. And so as we agree with God that we messed up more consistently, and as we surrender control to the Spirit, we count on that control of the Spirit. You and I are consistently in right fellowship with Him. And we will feel the affirmation of God. We will feel the drawing near of God. But the approval is always there, my friends. So let's agree, my friends, that you and I, moment to moment, will be in that relationship with God that allows us to admit what we messed up. 
and to remain more consistently in right fellowship. Let's you and I agree that we will continue to seek to be transformed by the renewing of our minds through this discipleship, through this, this time together as we grow in a spiritual development, in a relationship with each other, in a relationship with the Lord God. Will you join me in that quest? Let's agree to that. Will you pray with me?